So let's just take Uber as an example. What did they disrupt? Yeah, but what did they truly disrupt? Price. So there were taxis, so the Uber, is it, is it doing the same thing fundamentally that the taxi was doing? Is it taking you from A to B? Yeah, so the disruption is not in what they do, but it's in solving a problem. So they came and solved the problem of price. They came and solved the problem of convenience, because if you remember, you call a taxi and they're like, I'm 10 minutes away, 15 minutes later, they're still saying they're 10 minutes away, yeah? So it was that convenience, and I think that's how we have to think about disruption. There's a lot of disruption that has happened in Kenya. Equity Bank disrupted the banks. When Barclays was shutting down branches all over the country, Equity Bank went and took up a lot of those branches and started banking the unbanked. I believe the former Chase Bank disrupted. It's sad what happened to them, but I think they disrupted. They started banking SMEs and forming relationships with SMEs in a way no other bank till today has ever done. Yeah? I have a taxi guy, and since we talk about Uber, in my neighborhood who has disrupted, he's even disrupted Uber. <laughs> so when other guys, when he came, see what did the tax, and this is the thing about entrepreneurship, somebody comes in, you start complaining, and we want, we want to try and stab them in the back and remove them, a lot of the time I find that wasted energy. So the taxi drivers all over the world started complaining about Ubers. Have they been successful? No. So this taxi driver in my neighborhood decided, since Uber has come in, clearly his old business model of hanging around the road. And now think about what taxis used to do. We hang on the street hoping a customer will come. That is not a successful business formula. Let's hang around and hope a customer will come. So he started forming relationships with parents. And he's naturally extremely good with children. Yeah, so what did he start doing? School drop when you can't, school pick. I'll take them for swimming lessons. I'll take them for tuitions. In his car, he's got, you know, juices, waters, a sweet when they are good. He, call, he even, even the teachers know him. Has he disrupted? Is he a disruptor? He's found a niche because I, I can't put my four year old in an Uber. Correct? Can't say, Sasha, there's an Uber coming for you that I have no idea who it is, yeah? But I can, I can give, he's called James, I can give James my four-year-old. So we've really got to start thinking, it's not just about disruption, it's about are we being change agents? And change agency is only about being extremely connected to what is the problem I am solving. And sometimes this change will come in the form of a business model. This change may come in form of technology like Uber did. Technology was simply what enabled them to deliver the solution, yeah? So it may be technology, it may be the customer experience you create, it may be the culture in your organization that is also, is also disruptive. Okay, we together. So I want to share 10 ways I think I have learned if we look at disruption that way, I have learned about disruption in my own journey, and I think in the copious conversations I've actually had with people. Number one, disruption. Disrupt thinking that just because you started it, you must finish it. Sometimes we have to call it. It is not working. Yeah? And you have to know when to call it. Um, and for me, this, is, this has happened in many ways, so don't necessarily think I'm telling you to go shut down your business because times are tough, yeah? Let me tell you what I mean. My first business was in stock brokerage, and I started it for the very reason why that car was saying, because I wanted to be accountable to nobody. So already my motives were quite wrong for starting it, and I also started it because that's what I knew how to do. In my previous life, I was a pretty much a stockbroker. I used to help clients buy, advise them on what shares to buy. So when I thought of starting a business, that came to me automatically. That's what I'll start. So two years later, a lot has happened, ups, downs of running a business. But two years later, then the Safaricom IPO came. We spent a lot of time on that, a lot of resources on that. But after that, I remember feeling so sad. And I think 
it was just my season was over with that business because it was not really what I was passionate about. So a lot of times people ask, it's been really hard for this amount of time, should I stop, should I stop? And I want to tell you it's not an exact science of when to move on to something else. It's a combination of things that are happening outside, but what are you feeling about the business? When you're why, when you no longer have why are you doing this, and you can't answer that question. Do you feel like that sometime? You're like, I want to be in business, and you're like, I, I'm the one who started it, so I should hang on to it. No, sometimes maybe the business needs to evolve to something else, but when you're trying to hang on, you can't actually see. When I continued, we continued, the way I thought the business would work is not the way that the business has ended up working. When I still understood, and that, that first business taught me what I wanted to do because I, had, I started having conversations with people about money. I thought, so I went to my next business which was training for organizations. And I, was, I had done the business plan that showed me how many millions I will make because I had done the research on training budgets of Safaricom, Barclays, Tangbeek, all those clients that I thought would be my client. And I was like, you guys have a problem. Your employees are taking salary advances. They're not managing their money properly. Of course you need my solution. And it did not quite turn out the way I thought. Yeah? First of all, I never anticipated that you start the conversation in January, you do 10 meetings. By July, they're still asking for another meeting. By August, they're still asking for something else. If you're very lucky, they give you the work in September. I was like, okay, this my business plan did not factor in that at all. But beyond that, we all, it's also starting to say, who really is my customer? Yeah? The organization, and when you come to Centonomy, you learn about the difference between the channel and your customer. The organization was the channel, but the customer was really that person who's sitting in front learning to manage their money. So you ask yourself, is there a better way of reaching? This customer. So that's, I hadn't answered it. That started playing around in my head. Also disrupt thinking you are the only, your idea has to be the first one in the industry, yeah? So I go for a life coaching program and I see their model of approaching the customer directly and having a class system so that people get higher impact and that's when we actually changed our model. So we still, we still do training for organizations but it's more about the business model, we had to actually disrupt that. So I think from that point, just be willing to be open to learn and understand that in this process you are actually a student. Are we together? Disrupt thinking that you don't have options. Yeah. And don't, by this I mean don't sell your dream for short-term financial gain because too many of us actually do that and three years later, you're just like, I wish I had never done this. I learned this in two ways. So when I've changed the business and I'm now saying I'm doing personal finance training, it was hard. As I said, you start talking in January, they're giving you till September. Of course, you're trying to figure out how to make ends meet in the meantime, correct? So I would get people who are already training. By the way, me was not the first to do this training. We just did it differently, yeah? who are training and they said, you come as a trainer but under my brand, yeah? So I did it two or three times. In fact, there's a year we got a full contract with Standard Chartered to do training under their brand for a full year. At some point I had to say no. Maybe it was good in the beginning for me to learn something, but at some point I had to say no and really go back to why was I doing this business? When you're training under somebody else, first of all, you're sometimes selling your soul. You train the message they want you to hear. Yeah. Some financial institutions along the way who've come and proposed this to us have told us in our content they don't want us to show the mortgage calculator or the debt calculator because they don't want people to know exactly how much interest they are paying. Someone actually told us that. Yeah. So, so although losing the, that short-term money was very hard, don't, don't think you don't have options, yeah? So don't sell your soul for a financial benefit. And this is how I learned I have options. One day, still in this 
season that every entrepreneur has to go through where you're confused, the world is confused about you, your money is confused, you're stressed, you know that period, yeah? I go for a, an interview to, again, I've pitched for a job as a trainer, but now under my brand. I'm still relatively new. And the guy, the trainer there says, nobody knows you, how do we trust you? Your quote is more expensive than the three other quotes we've received. And my mind almost went into default. Let me reduce my price. Yeah? Why should we choose you? And it came out before I could stop myself. And I think it is something each and every one of us constantly have to tell ourselves. I told that guy because I am the best. I am the best. Get comfortable with that word. I am the best. Now, at that point, honestly, I felt like it was somebody else speaking. In fact, after that, I was like, Washeke, what have you done? Now the word is going to go around the, the country. You know how your mind starts playing with you? That you are this proud, because we think it's very, someone who says, I am the best, they are arrogant, yeah? Now even me, I was telling the same story to myself. You're so arrogant, you talked about being the best, you're not going to get this job, you're not going to get any other job. I suggest you go and polish up your CV and go back to what you know best. So there was an awkward moment where he couldn't believe I've said it, I couldn't believe I said it. And the meeting ended extremely awkwardly. Yeah, because then I was sure I would never see him again. Three hours later he called and I had the job. Yeah, and it's, it's moments like that that when I say disruption, sometimes you've got to disrupt how you think about yourself. Ask me this, does your customer want you to be the best? When, I'm buying, when a customer is buying something from you, are they coming to buy from you because they think they have another alternative? No, you, you've got to be the best. And if you being the best in what you do and how you do it, does not take away anybody's right to be their best in their own game. So if you do not believe you are the best, fix it. Yeah, Because it is the best that go forward. And it is the people who believe they are the best. So fix whatever is happening that makes you believe that you are actually not the best. So one, two, three, I am the best. One, two, three, I am the best. So as you walk out of here today, mediocrity cannot take us anywhere. Yeah. So just saying, I'm not doing this just because it's going to be another Reja Reja business. This course we created is not just for people who want a Reja Reja business. Yeah? It's got to be for people who believe they can actually fundamentally build a great business, and I believe every one of us has the capacity to do that. Disrupt thinking what you have is your limit. And every successful person I've ever talked to had to do this. And last week I gave a talk at our open day called Raising Your Frequency. And this is the analogy I used. If you want to listen to 98.4 Capital FM, can you put 28.4 and hope to listen to Capital FM? You've got to be tuned into Capital FM. There's a talk I once went to where a billionaire said, it was about the billionaire mindset, and this billionaire said, to become a billionaire you have to speak in billions, you have to, before the billions show up, this is all before the billions show up, think in billions, plan in billions, pitch to possible investors in billions, go to the bank and have the guts to ask for billions in loans. Do you understand the thinking behind that? That's how you make a billion. So I think for all of us, we have to understand a lot of this game is disrupting what we think our potential is and what we define as our limit. How did I learn this? In my worst financial period in my life, and I know a couple of you have heard me say this story of my 200 bob moment, where the first business has shut down literally the stock brokerage business, the second business I'm still in this phase, and it's in the, it was that, in that in-between period I found myself in the worst financial situation in my life. The financial situation where the ATM laughs at you for trying to withdraw money. You know that kind of financial situation? That one. But I was starting this personal financial planning business as we, as we knew it at that time. So I got a client. Yeah, okay, I've heard you're doing this. Come and help me plan your money. 
This guy was probably earning in a salary a million shillings a month, and he needed help planning money. Now, so that you understand my financial position at that time, I was like, oh, we are meeting in Lovington. Okay. Hmm. Matter what you have, it's about raising your frequency. Yeah? So to be able to do provide the service for that client, I went and talked to other people. I did my research. I experimented on some things, and by the time I did his financial plan, he was extremely happy, and I was paid enough money to get put fuel in my car. Okay. So you've got to have an ecosystem around you. You can't do it alone. That's why I'm saying this, is, this game is really going to be about raising your frequency. Who's that ecosystem? It could be a mentor. It could be taking a program like ours. It could be something you need to learn. It could be another group of people that you can talk to and bounce off ideas. It could be reading. Yeah? But you've got to be in that game of, it could be someone who can give you technical support. It could be partners. But what you have, what is in your bank account, what is the, the current people you know, have no, there's, there's no relationship with, it, with what you have and where you want to go. And the minute we understand that, we start moving forward. You will go where your mind t takes you. Disrupt your thinking on time. In the investment world, people talk about return on investment. And it's important. Investors, if they come and invest in your business, will typically want to understand, if I put in 5 million shillings, what am I going to get out of it, and how long is it going to take me to get that money back? Yeah? It's called a return on investment. Now, you as the entrepreneur, you have to think about return on investment, but you also have to think about return on time. You have 8 hours a day, maybe 10 you and Safaricom, do you have the same amount of hours in a day? So what is the difference? What resource have they used better than you since you? <laughs> Time. They still have eight hours a day. What do they make and what do you make? Okay? I'll just leave you to mull over that, yeah? But as you're going around your business, and I think people get so scared to do things like hiring of people, investing in technology in the business, investing in efficient systems, and spending the money because they don't understand. Yes, it's an investment, but it's going to give me a higher return on time. So when I started financial planning, as I told you, I started with one client, one client. But after a while, I was like, this is going to take a really long time to achieve the impact I want it to have. I can see all of, even if I'm at my peak, five clients a day, 20 clients, a, 20 clients a week, and now I look at Centonomy and we've impacted in the hundreds of thousands of people, yeah? So like if it was just me and my one hour and my one client, not, not a good return on, on time. And there's a limit to what the client can pay you. So this model, I started thinking, how do I spend the same hour but with 10 people? Because all 10 people you find, you see five clients, they all wanted the same information. They all literally wanted the same service. So can I spend the same one hour with five people, then one hour with 40 people? Today we're spending three hours with almost 300 people in this room. So even for your business, start thinking, what are the things I need to put in place to give me a higher return on time? A lot of the times you find entrepreneurs doing the things that give them very low return on time, because they're not making the necessary investments to give them a higher return on time. So think about return on time as much as you think about return on money. Disrupt believing bigger revenues make a better company. I think over the past we've seen companies with extremely huge revenues going down. Correct? Yeah. So great revenues and more money is fine. But if you do not become extremely customer focused in your business, it is not going to be a great company. So where we are going now in the entrepreneurship space is people who understand their customer. And I don't mean just understanding your customer like, you know how, how do we, de when we're told who is your customer, what are, what are we most likely to say? They earn, correct? They earn 50,000 shillings. 
They live here. See, in Kenya, we have a good way of defining customers as middle class, upper, lower, and then you think you have a great description of who your customer is. Multinational. If it's organizations, we talk about SME multinational. That's okay just as a beginning. It's not going to get you very far. This is what I mean by defining your customer. Let's say your customer is called Jack, and we teach you how to do this in class, but let me give you an example. Jack drives a Subaru. Over the weekend, Jack goes for Nyamachoma with his friend. Jack shops at Carrefour and buys bread from Carrefour. Jack tends to fuel at Total. On Friday nights, you might find Jack watching football at XYZ with two or three of his friends. Do you understand? Can you see the difference? You know the behaviors of your customer. That is what is called being customer focused. Now, if you know Jack that well, and since we're talking about disruption, are you, if you're in tune that way with Jack, are you likely to start understanding when Jack's tastes and preferences change? Yes. People get disrupted because you didn't under, you thought your customer was Jack and you are assuming the same things about Jack still hold to be true. So you're in the world of constantly innovating, and I mean understanding your customer better and better and better. Okay? If there's one thing I wish I could have been told from the first day I started my business is collect information. We now call it data, and big data is a big business in the world. Yeah? And the people who now will understand how to collect data, analyze data, and use the data are going to go a lot further than the people who don't. So from tomorrow, if there's one thing I can tell you to do, start collecting data. If you have data about 10 of your clients, you're, you're way ahead than most people are. Most people are still assuming Jack is middle class, he does this, hence he should want that. Not necessarily, necessarily true. Disrupt thinking that your customer also, based on this, now that we've understood Jack, why does Jack make decisions? Just explain. Just the way we've described Jack. Why would Jack make a decision? What, what do you have to do for Jack for him to make a decision to buy your product or your service? You're solving a problem, but what are you doing for Jack? Because Jack is a human being who's going around his day and life having human experiences. Jack is not going to buy your product or service just purely based on logic. He'll buy it based on emotion. Do you make Jack feel good? Do you make Jack feel successful? Yeah. There's a lady who came into our program and we, once we did this exercise with her, of understanding your customer that way, she realized people come to her clothes shop. They could go to any other clothes shop. She comes, they come to her clothes shop because she makes them feel good. Not because, because her designs and whatever are so much more greater than the next shop. Yeah? But she now did the, we give you a, 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 a way to do this. She did the assignments and she find out, actually people come here because I, I make them feel good. Then she made, Making customers feel good, good a culture in her business. So the customer has to feel good all the way from the cleaner to the salesperson to her. So in her shop, you don't enter and you're told things like, ah, hey, you've added. No, no. <laughs> no. Have you ever been to a shop that you will go frequently, they become a, a, a little bit too used to you and they're like, ah, you've added. I'm like, hey, hey, no. That's that. So just understanding, yes, there's a need you are solving. There's a problem you're solving. But there's still a re an emotional reason that is making your client relate with your, you versus somebody else. It is extremely valuable to you to understand that reason because it will then disrupt how you communicate. It will disrupt how you reach them. It will disrupt the value add that you give them. Maybe you're marketing and spending so much time and things on marketing, but you're not emotionally con connecting with that, with, that, with that customer. Disrupt. Are we together? Okay. Disrupt your fear. Okay. 
um, you cannot get away without being somebody who experiments. Just think about yourself as somebody who is in a lab, pouring all those chemicals into test tubes and experiment. That is part of the game. So you've got to have, there's what is running, but there's got to be an aspect of your time that is spent on the experiment. If you're not constantly experimenting on something, you're not going to, someone will come and disrupt you. You're not going to keep up with what is actually happening. So, we don't experiment because of what? Failure. Fear of failure. So we've got to stop thinking that failure is this thing that should never happen to me. Honestly, I don't want to even do business with you if you've never failed. You know why? I'll, I'll be like, my goodness, I'm your first experiment. Yeah? Tell me how many ten times you have failed, I'm more likely to do business with you. Then I'm like, at least they've got it down. Failure is just the school fees. It is just a school fees that has to be paid, and we've got to start looking at it like that. Don't fear failure. So I'm not telling you go and spend millions on the experiment. Experiment on things you can fail fast and fail cheaply. So a lot of times we, we businesses fail because they didn't experiment. My first business, I made the mistake of assuming things will work the way it worked in my previous employer. So I went and got partners in to give me some money and went and got this office in Parklands. I even had an assistant slash analyst. Then when me and my assistant slash analyst and myself were sitting there looking at each other with no customers, I had to ask myself some pertinent questions. I should have just experimented. Cheap. Start from working from home. So when I started St. Thomas, it was my, my first office of St. Thomas was in my bedroom because I've learned my lesson. So experiment cheaply doesn't mean you go and spend five million shillings on an idea. Just experiment, test it out. Then it's that testing that will give you some data. Data, correct? Even experiment gives you data. Even what works. Learning what does not work is also data. Yeah? That you can use to now say, okay, we've tried this one, now we can spend 100K. Then we can spend 200K. Disrupt, another thing we fear, and I want us to challenge and disrupt this thinking. If I share, if I open up my client base to my employees, if I share this idea with a possible partner, what will happen? People will steal my idea. This is an excuse to stay small. It is an excuse to stay comfortable. I'm not telling you go and tell, you don't have to be in the bar broadcasting your ideas. That is not what I'm saying. But if you have found the right people, especially when it comes to your team, they've really got to know your vision, your clients, you've really got to go and enter the game of empowering them. Because when you don't share, when you don't open up, that means you have to do everything yourself, you stay small. So I want you, if that's your fear, ask yourself, and if that has been holding you back, what is the cost of my fear? Do you want to stay comfortable or do you want to grow? The two cannot, cannot, cannot relate. And let me tell you what I've learned about if I open up, people will come and steal my idea. And it's, and it's, and it's, and it's going to link to a second thing I would do yeah actually it's linking to my second point so I'll just I'll just say it disrupt thinking that running a business is just about getting as many clients as possible it's not when you so, so even in us we've had people who've come and sat in our program so that they can go and teach the same program so you have someone who has sat in and then shortly you hear so and so is at has hired a room at Biblica, Dennis Street, and they have the exact same program as you, and they are charging 5K. I'm like, they're charging 5K, success to them. Yeah? People, your competitive advantage is not just the product or service that people see. Your competitive advantage is the design of your business. Building a business is creating a design. And the design is the, the culture that you have with the people who are in your business. That's a design. The structures, how you deliver the service to your customer is a, is a design. Whether people who came and tried to do what we do, they underestimated how we train is also a design. 
Our relationships with our training team is a design. So there are so many things behind that are working behind the scenes to deliver a fantastic product to, to our customers that people take for granted. So take more confidence in your design, which is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to replicate. Not so much in, oh, so and so will steal my idea. Usually there's very little that people can do with, a, with an idea. This is why, when you understand that business is a design, this is why hustling is not entrepreneurship. I bring in goods from China and I sell. Maybe that's your starting point, maybe that's a starting point, but it's not entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is the whole value that is being created in this vehicle that you are running. Yeah? So you can import, export, fine. That, but you can be an importer and exporter that is thinking about the whole value system that I'm actually creating. But because I, I imported toothpicks and I sold them, does not necessarily make me. Can you see why it doesn't necessarily make you an entrepreneur? Because entrepreneurs think about a lot more. Disrupt thinking the assumptions that worked for your business yesterday will work today. So we talked about Uber, the assumptions that the cab drivers kept thinking the same assumptions will work. What are the assumptions? The client will continue being willing to pay 2,000 bob from Westlands to town. It was ridiculous, yeah? The client will be willing to continue being conned that I'm 10 minutes away and I get away with it. So even in our business, it's always good. Whatever business you are running, today you've made certain assumptions about that business. Yeah? You have a shop. You've made these clients still have the same level of income. This location is still convenient for them. These are the designs they still like. You've also made assumptions about maybe the general economy. The economy will still keep growing in this line of customers at this rate. So go back and ask yourself, what are the assumptions? And when we do strategy, we ask people this. List down the assumptions that make it possible to run your business. Every business is running on assumptions. Correct? Now, what do you have to keep track of? As you keep doing that thing of collecting information about your customers and starting to be knowledgeable, be more aware of what's happening around the economy and things like that, what, what is your role when it comes to the assumptions? Keep understanding, do those, are those, do those assumptions hold true or have they shifted? And if they have shifted, you've got to do something, something differently. Okay? We together? This one I'll talk about until I die, and I still meet many business people who don't do this, even people who own big businesses. Disrupt thinking that you can't afford to pay yourself. How many people here think they can't afford to pay themselves? Because I should have started with a question first, yeah? Now nobody wants to be shame on me and put up their hand, yeah? Or disrupt thinking this statement that you say, how many people here pay themselves? Maybe that's what I should ask. How many people here pay themselves? How many people here are running businesses? Okay. Uh -huh. My point exactly. I've asked in a different way. I've gotten the answer. We falsely believe we can't pay ourselves because if you pay yourself, you're not going to be able to afford to do this. I'm not telling you to start with a huge figure. I'm starting to asking you to start the discipline of paying yourself. Why? When you consider yourself a free resource and you are able to be a free resource, you don't aim and plan properly for your business. Maybe your business needs, for example, 300,000 shillings a month and there you are factored in salaries for other people, rent, paying suppliers, etc. Who have you not factored? Yourself. So every month, what figure is in your head that you're aiming for? 300,000. Maybe you should be aiming for 400,000 so that you pay yourself. So you're staying small because you're constantly staying on that rat race. We get money, it goes. We get money, it goes. We are just surviving. To shift away from survival, you've got to pay yourself. Even if you want to start with that 10 Gs that's under the tax radar, because another reason people give us when we do the classes is they don't want to pay tax. And I'm like, if, you, you're, focused, if you're focused on not paying tax, then you can't be focused on growth. Yeah, you can't. You can't do two things at the same time. Yeah? So not paying tax is keeping you small. Yeah? But we'll teach you how to do tax efficiently, efficiently as well. 
When it's time to grow and you need to hire the people who cost you money, if you're not paying yourself, will you see why you should pay them? No. But at some point in your business, you will need to hire the people who will cost you money. Yeah? But if you've never been paying yourself, nobody else is going to come and be willing to work for free like you. Let's fast forward and say this is a business you want to sell in the future. The way valuation works is they'll see if you, the CEO he wants to leave and they've not been paying themselves, we have to recruit a new CEO who we have to now pay. They'll tell you then your company is less, the value is less than you thought because we have to factor in as an expense which you did not have before, meaning you get less money. Can you see? It doesn't. And we'll show you, in the class, we'll show you exactly how to do this and why it works this way and how to start and all that. But pay yourself. And also, people get resentful of their businesses after a certain point if it's not working for them financially. Don't you want your business to work for you financially as well? If it doesn't, you're going to resent it, so you have to start somehow. We wear, I don't pay myself like a badge of honor. It's not a badge of honor. Honor. It's a business where something needs to shift. Don't feel guilty. You're not supposed to be a martyr to this business. Pay yourself. Now, my last point is disrupt. And me, I've been now in business 10 years with Centonomy, another two years in the, in the businesses that didn't work out. So 12 years in a business. And now I can honestly say disrupt thinking that you will be there forever. And in the beginning, early stages, you're so tied up with the business, you're passionate about it, but what happens over time is you realize you cannot do everything. So as your business grows, as I started saying in the beginning, disrupt how you think about time, you will start understanding these are the things I need to spend time on so that the business can grow. And they, sometimes they're not the things that involve day to day. Most of the times they're not the things that involve day to day. And these are the things I need to let go. If you're focused on doing everything, your business will not grow. Please understand that you are not the best in everything. In fact, you are ter completely hopeless and terrible at some things. And I love what Beatrice said when you am like, this, Fundi, I'm not, I'm not getting involved. Accounting, I'm not getting involved. And I think we need to put our egos aside and actually admit you, you are extremely horrible at doing some things. Can we just admit that? You are extremely horrible. But your business needs that skill. It is not you. So learn to let go of what you are not good at. Either get a part-time person, an intern, a consultant, an empl full-time employee with you to do the things you are not good at because you, do, you will never thrive doing the things that you are not good at. Okay? Secondly, and I think this is the theme of what we teach in the Centronomy Entrepreneur, these businesses should be built to run without you. Yeah? It's very disheartening to see businesses that have been built or are being built, but they're not going to survive the founder. You know how we here talk about Apple, Google, yeah? We have all these global companies. We talk about Barclays. We have the Standard Chartered. And I think it's time as a country we start challenging ourselves. Can we have more local companies that can talk the same story? That the founder is not there, but the business is running. And what we show you in this program is how, how that thinking starts. So be willing to not be the CEO. As I stand here today, I am not the CEO of Centonomy. When I start, yes, I'll accept the clapping. Thank you. Yeah. I am not the CEO of Centonomy. And some of you may find yourself like me in this journey where the business grows beyond you. Yeah. The business needs a certain management and skill that you had when it was at this size, but for where we want to go, it needs a certain, a better level of management and skill, which I honestly believe my team and Waivaka have. Yeah? What am I good at? It was, also, it was also thinking, what am I good at and what is now my value to this company? My value to this company is ensuring that we continue creating products that transform people's lives. So that is pretty much what I do at Centonomy and continuing to bring my experience and learning how to guide the company strategically. That is my input to the company. Because what's my dream? That I'll be in heaven 
First, I've already declared I'll be in heaven. God has heard. Yeah? And syntonomy is going on. And along the way, there may be other, other changes, but really, I'm really encouraging people, start thinking about the business beyond yourself. Because leadership is not what happens because you are there. Let's also disrupt how we think about being a leader. We think about being a leader is being there, people under a nose, and think great things are happening because you are there. That's not what being a great leader is. Leadership is what happens because you are not there, as you are not there. So I encourage all of you to just disrupt your thinking about your business, yourself, your circumstances, your money, the people around you, what you can actually do, and let's all work together to really bring in the entrepreneurship spirit that this country so, so, so badly needs. Thank you.